everyone welcome back to my channel my name is Tess and in this video I'll be sharing with you my thoughts from the recent Q&A that Charlie Munger did at the Daily General Corporation annual general meeting. Let's just dive right into the white elephant in the room. Why did Munger purchase Alibaba and why did Warren Buffett not purchase Alibaba? So just to give you a bit of background, Charlie Munger actually purchased Alibaba recently and he has become one of his top three largest holdings. So to that question, Charlie Munger actually said this. This one comes from John Mooney in Marshfield, Massachusetts. And he says, Charlie, Alibaba is a top three holding for you. It sells at a steep discount to its US peers. Best comparable is Amazon, which is triple Alibaba's PE. So what discount should, should US investors seek when buying Chinese stocks, considering the political, regulatory, and especially the ownership structure risk? Oh, and, and considering the fortune Berkshire made on your BYD suggestion, why doesn't Buffett buy Alibaba? Well, Warren, like many other intelligent people, likes to invest where he's personally comfortable. And for some reason, I'm more comfortable with the Chinese than he is. That's a minor difference. And, but I have all kinds of places where I'm just like Warren. I have all kinds of things where I'm not comfortable and I just don't go near them. I think an old guy is entitled to invest where he wants to invest in. What makes you uncomfortable? What do you not? It's do okay you? to have some things that you just don't want to bother with. Like, uh, uh, like crypto, I got. I don't think Alibaba is as as it is. I don't think Alibaba is as entrenched as something like Apple and Alphabet. I think the internet is going to be a very competitive place, even if you're a big internet retailer. So you can see from this clip that Charlie Manga is obviously more pro-China than Buffett. And this clip also highlights that, you know, as an investor, we have to know where is our circle of competence and choose to invest in places that we are comfortable in. Charlie Munger also recognizes that the internet is a very competitive space, even for big retailers and big names like Alibaba. So due to the very nature of the internet, you know, it being very low barriers to entry, so therefore new incumbents can just enter and consumers we are ever demanding right we always want the best things the best variety at the lowest cost so this becomes a very very competitive industry to be in next charlie Munger also expressed his opinions about crypto and whether you know he will choose to admit that you know he actually missed out something so this is what he has to say uh, Charlie, crypto was another question that I got a lot of. I'll, I'll ask this one from Carl Musca Moscatello, who says, crypto is a $2 trillion asset class. Are you willing to admit you missed something? Well, I certainly didn't invest in crypto. <laughs> I'm proud of the fact I've avoided it. It's like, you know, some venereal disease or something. I just regard it as beneath contempt. Some people think it's modernity and they welcome a currency that's so useful in extortions and kidnappings and so on and so on, tax evasion. And, and, it, and of course the envy, everybody has to create his own new currency. And I think that's crazy too. So I'm I'm not having any, I wish it had been banned immediately. And I admire the Chinese for banning it. I think they were right and we, we've been wrong to allow it. Perhaps this is the appropriate follow-up then. This comes from Micah Mysick who asks, Mr. Munger, you've been warning of the evil evils of cryptocurrency in the past. How do you feel about the Federal Reserve preparing to launch a central bank digital currency? Do you think that this will be beneficial or harmful to the strength and resilience of our markets? No, no, the Federal Reserve could have a currency if they want one. That, that would be just a, we've got a digital currency already. It's called a bank account. The banks are all integrated with the Federal Reserve System. We already have a digital currency. So as you've seen from the clip, Charlie Munger actually hates the negative spillover effects that crypto brings, such as tax evasions, extortions, 
uh, kidnappings and so on. Um, and we can also see that Warren Buffett also echoes the same beliefs and he actually says that crypto is like rat poison. So in my personal opinion, I think that you know while there are legitimate use cases for crypto, um, that crypto as an investment itself is something that I would also stay away from because firstly, it is not within my circle of competence. I don't really understand it well. And also more importantly, um, my style of investing, I would say, is closer to value investing, which is buying anything at a, a discount to its intrinsic value. And crypto itself is an asset that is very hard or nearly impossible to give a value to it. Next, Charlie Munger was also asked about his macro expectations about the rising interest rates in the upcoming decades. So here's what he has to say. Uh, Leonard Mikowski writes in, he says he's a mechanical engineer from Germany. He said the last year has been challenging for him because he started working full time while raising a four year old, finishing his PhD and supporting his wife for her state examination. He said it really helped him stay rational, humorous and cheerful by listening to your interviews, speeches and questions and answers on a daily basis. So he wants to thank you for being such an insightful, generous, straightforward and honest speaker. His question is, do you think it's likely that we will experience a major increase in interest rates in the upcoming decades, like, for example, in the period between 1950 and 1980? Well, that, of course, is a very intelligent question and a very difficult question. When you throw money, when you print money on the scale that modern nations are printing it, Japan, the United States, Europe, et cetera, we're getting into new territory in terms of size. The Japanese bought back not only a lot of their own debt, but a lot of their common stocks. So the Federal Reserve System, you can't imagine how much money printing J Japan has done. And they haven't had all that much inflation and they it's still a very admirable civilization. In fact, you, you could argue that Japan is one of the more admirable civilizations in the whole world. And in spite of all this very extreme uh, government money printing they've done, and they haven't had terrible consequences. Now they've had 25 years of stasis with living standards not improving very much. I don't think that came from their macroeconomic policies. I think that came from the rise of tough competition for their export powerhouse from China and Korea. But at any rate, it's weird what's happening and nobody knows for sure how it's gonna work out. Uh, I think it's encouraging that Japan can print as much money as it has and remain as civilized and calm as, and, and admirable as it has. And so I hope to God the United States is similar happy outcome. But I think the Japanese are better adapted for stasis than we are. I think it's a duty-filled, civilized bunch of people, a lot of them older, not many young people, and, and they just suck it in and cope. In our country, we have terrible tensions. It's way harder to run a country which is not monoethnic like Japan. There's some professor at Harvard that has written extensively on this subject. It's way harder to run a nation like the United States with different ethnicities and groups and so forth than it is to run Japan. There are, Japan is basically sort of a monoethnic civilization which is proud of its ethnicity. And of course they can cope with it troubles more than better than some other people can. So what I found really interesting about this clip is how Charlie Munger gave the example of the Japanese government buying back tons of debt and common stock as well as printing tons of money. But essentially, this is actually what the US government did as well, right? But perhaps on a larger scale, yet the impact on the citizens is vastly different. He says that it's perhaps due to culture because Japanese culture is much more mono-ethnic. People are, quoting from him, more duty-filled, more civilized, 
and therefore they will just kind of like suck it up and you know follow what the government says so this made me think about my country singapore where i live and whether such things i mean of course singapore being a country that has tons of fiscal budget they probably wouldn't be in this position but it made me think whether the culture in singapore would also how would it play out you know in such a situation because i think we won't be as extreme as compared to the japanese being very very mono ethnic um and we are actually highly westernized so i think it's really interesting to see how culture does play a role in you know um, the government implementing economic policies so in the same vein of macro expectations he was also asked the questions how should we as investors deal with inflation so let's take a pause and hear what he has to say stephen tedder from Atlanta writes in, um, he had similar concerns about inflation, but he takes it a step further. He says, how will this all play out? And what's the best advice you have for individual investors to optimally deal with the negative impact of inflation other than owning quality equities? Well, it may be that you have to choose the least bad of your a bunch of options that frequently happens in human decision making and the mongers have berkshire stock costco stock chinese stock suli lu uh, a little bit of daily journal stock and a bunch of apartment houses do i think that's perfect no do i think it's okay yes I think the great lesson from the mongers is you don't need all this damn diversification. That's plenty of, you're lucky if you've got four good assets. <laughs> I think the finance professors and the, that sell the idea that perfect diversification is professional investment. If you're trying to do better than average, you're lucky if you have four things to buy and to ask for 20 is really asking for egg in your beer. It's, it's <laughs> very few people get, can have enough brains to get 20 good investments. So what Charlie Munger is trying to say here is that we don't need all these diversification. And no, it's not that we don't need to diversify our portfolio at all, but rather it's this common misconception that, you know, oh, I have to own 20 stocks, I have to own 30 stocks in order for my portfolio to be considered as diversified. But honestly, if you think about it, most of us won't have the time and the capacity to actually analyze 20, 30 over stocks um, unless you're you know, a full-time fund manager. So this diversification is really quite a myth. And you know, if you want to learn more about diversification, I will also make a video about it. So do let me know in the comments below. Next, Charlie Munger also shared his thoughts about the Great Resignation and as we know, all of us have been working from home mostly due to COVID. And he believes that, you know, this will probably go on forever. You know, the habit and trend of working from home or hybrid working. Charlie Munger also thinks that the U.S. government is perhaps too liberal in giving out welfare. Charlie, Jeffrey Malloy from San Francisco writes in, he says, much media attention has been focused on the large numbers of Americans who've resigned from their jobs over the last year. What do you make of this trend and what advice would you give to CEOs seeking to retain their employees? Well, this is a very interesting thing that the pandemic has given us. An awful lot of people have gotten used to not being in the office of five days a week. And I think a lot of those people are never going back to five days a week. It's amazing the percentage of the people in computer science that don't want to be in the office for a normal life. Uh, they want to do a lot of it from locations that are more convenient to them. I think a lot of that's going to remain forever. I, I don't think we're going back to, I don't think the average corporation is going to fly its directors around so they can sit at the same table for every meeting of the year. Maybe they'll have two meetings where the directors are together. By the way, Berkshire's directors have done that forever. 
The Berkshire directors have met face to face twice a year forever and done everything else on the telephone or with consent minutes. And it's worked fine for Berkshire. I don't think we needed all these goddamn meetings and airplane flights. So I think part of what's happening is quite constructive that it'll get make life simpler and cheaper and more efficient. I don't think we're going back for some kinds of work. Now, on the other hand, they get, they made the welfare so liberal of just helicoptering this money out that it was just hell to even man your restaurant so you can serve the patrons. I think we probably overdid that a little. I think Larry Summers is quite possibly right that we overshot a little with some of the stimulus and we would have been smarter with to do a little less. If you stop to think about it, what makes capitalism work is the fact that if you're an able-bodied young person, if you refuse to work, you suffer a fair amount of agony. And, and it's because of that agony that the whole economic system works. And so, The only effective economies that we've had that brought us modernity and the prosperity we now have, they imposed a lot of hardship on young people who didn't want to work. You take away all the hardship and say you can stay home and get more than you you get if you come to work, it's quite disruptive to an economic system like ours. The next time we do this, I don't think we ought to be quite so liberal. So apart from Alibaba, which we have heard his opinion on earlier on in this video, Charlie Munger also shared his opinion on Costco. So here's what he has to say. Um, Charlie, another question came in about Costco. Um, Ami Patel from California, you recently talked about bubbles and high valuations in your Sohn conference talk. Is Costco a part of that? Costco has never traded at a higher price to sales or price to earnings multiple. How should new investors think about Costco given its record run? Well, that's a very good question. And I've always believed that nothing was worth an infinite price. So at some, even an admirable place like Costco could get to a price where you would say that's too high. But I would argue that if I were investing money for some sovereign wealth fund or some pension fund, and a 30, 40, 50 year time horizon, I would buy Costco at the current price. I think it's that strong an enterprise and that admirable a place. Now, I'm not saying I would, I can't bring myself with my habits to pay these big prices. But I never even think about selling a share of Costco just because it's selling at a high price. So if you stop to think about it, I bought at Christmas time a flannel shirt, a bunch of flannel shirts at Costco. They cost $7 each, more or less. And it was a soft flannel and it was better and so forth. And then I bought pants, I think they were Orvis pants. And I pay like $7 and they stretch around my waist and they're partly water resistant, what have you. Costco is going to be an absolute titan on the internet because they got curated products that everybody trusts and huge purchasing power on a limited number of stocking units. So I'm not worried about, I, I, I'm not saying I'm buying Costco at this price, but I'm certainly not selling any. I think it's going to be a big, powerful company as long as far ahead as you can see. And I think it deserves its success. I think it has a, a good culture and a good moral ethos. And so uh, I wish everything else in America is working as well as Costco does.
Think what a buzzing that would be for us all. So Costco is overvalued now. So Charlie Munger says that he won't invest in Costco at the current price. However, if he were to have a longer time horizon, say about 30 to 50 years, he will choose to invest in Costco. And he also says that, you know, despite its high price right now, Charlie Munger is not going to sell Costco because he believes that Costco is a great company with good culture, good employees, and people there have a good moral ethics. So he believes that it's well run and this company will prove to be a great company forever. There's also a question that pertains to the type of investing style that Charlie Munger would recommend to a 22-year-old who is swinging between tech, AI growth stocks, and you know, monthly income and dividend stocks. So here's what he has to say. Uh, Mickey and Michael Fontenet wrote in uh, seeking advice for a 22-year-old investing growth uh, or monthly in income from div to get the monthly income from dividend dividends. They say they have a 22-year-old brilliant young neighbor. He's achieved an internship at Tesla and GE and is currently a student at Purdue. He takes advantage of his 37 years, his neighbor's 37 years in the oil field. The neighbor takes advantage of his tech savvy and Reddit and the meme crowd. Uh, his inclination is to advise him to continually slow drip into monthly income and dividend investing as opposed to swinging for the fences and AI and growth stocks. What would you advise, sir? Well, I don't think I have a one-size-fit-all investment. For I think some people are gifted enough that they can invest in in hard-to-value, difficult things. Other people... I think would be very wise to have more modest ambitions in terms of what they choose to deal with. So I think you have to figure out your level of skill or the level of skill your advisor has, and that should enter the equation. But to everyone who finds the current investment climate hard and difficult and somewhat confusing, I would say welcome to adult life. And you're thinking the right thing. Of course, it is hard. It's going to be way harder for the group that is not that's graduating from college now. For them to get rich and stay rich and so forth, it's going to be way harder for them than it was for my generation. Think what it costs to own a house in a desirable neighborhood in a city like Los Angeles. It's not a... And I think we'll probably end up with higher income taxes too and so on. No, I, I think the investment world is plenty hard and I don't think the, in my lifetime, 98 years, it was the ideal time to own a diversified portfolio of common stocks that updated a little by adding the new ones that came in like the apples and the alphabets and so forth. And I'd say the people got maybe 10 or 11% if you did that very intelligently before inflation and maybe 9% after inflation, 8 or 9%. That was a marvelous return. That, no other generation in the history of the world ever got returns like that. And I don't think the future is going to give the guy graduating from college this year nearly that easy an investment opportunity. I think it's going to be way harder. So indeed, there's no one-size-fits-all kind of investment strategy. We have to know our investment risk appetite, our circle of competence, and really invest in places that we are comfortable in. So Charlie Munger also shared that, you know, with this current climate now, with rising interest rates, inflation, higher income taxes, people in my generation, the younger generation, have a harder time to get rich, stay rich, compared to people in his generation. So as we move towards the end of the AGM, Charlie Munger actually shares his thoughts about the future outlook of the market and the economy. Watch to the end because what I'm about to share now, as well as my next point, is going to be perhaps what encompasses the entire two hour long AGM that I found the most valuable. This question comes in from Steve, who says, what worries you most about our economy and stock market? And on the other hand, what makes you optimistic? Well, you have to be optimistic about 
the competency of our technical civilization. But there again, it's an interesting thing. If you take the last 100 years, 18, 1922 to 2022, most of modernity came in in that 100 years. And in the previous 100 years, that got another big chunk of modernity. And before that, things were pretty much the same for the previous thousands of years. Life was pretty brutal and short and limited and what have you. No printing press, no air conditioning, no modern medicine, no. It's so, and I don't think we're going to get things that were in what I call the real human needs. Think of what it meant to get, well, say, first you got the steam engine, the steamship, the railroad, and a little bit of improvement of farming and a little bit of improvement in plumbing. That's what you got in the, in the 100 years that ended in 1922. The next 100 years gave us widely distributed electricity, modern medicine, modern fire oils, the automobile, the airplane, the, the records, the movies, the air conditioning in the South. And think what a blessing it was if you wanted five children, I mean, if you wanted six children, if you wanted three children, you had to have six because three died in infancy. That was our ancestors. Think of the agony of watching half your children die. It, it just, it's amazing how much achievement there's been in civilization in these last 200 years and most of it in the last 100 years. Now, the trouble with it is, is, is that the basic needs are pretty well filled. In the United States, the principal problem of the poor people is they're too fat. That is a very different place from what happened in the past. The, in the past, they were on the edge of starving. And, and what happens is it's really interesting is with all this enormous increase in living standards and freedom and diminishment of racial inequities and all the huge progress that has come, people are less happy about the state of affairs than they were when things were way tougher. And that has a very simple explanation. The world is not driven by greed, it's driven by envy. And so the fact that everybody's five times better off than they used to be, they take it for granted. All they think about is somebody else has having more now and it's not fair that he should have it and they don't. That's the reason that God came down and told Moses that you couldn't envy your neighbor's wife or even his donkey. I mean, even the, the old Jews were having trouble with envy. And so it's built into the nature of things. It, it's weird for somebody my age because I was in the middle of the Great Depression when the hardship was unbelievable. I was safer walking around Omaha in the evening than I am in my own neighborhood in Los Angeles after all this great wealth and so forth. So, and I, I have no way of doing anything about it. I can't change the fact that a lot of people are very unhappy and feel very abused after everything's improved by about 600% because there's still somebody else who has more. I have conquered envy in my own life. I don't envy anybody. I don't give a damn what somebody else has. But other people are driven crazy by it. And other people play to the envy in order to advance their own uh, political careers. And we have whole networks now that are, that they want to pour gasoline on the flames of envy. I, I like the religion of the old Jews. I, I like the people who were against envy, not the people who were trying to profit from it. 
But if you stop to think, think of the pretentious expenditures of the rich. Who in the hell needs a real Rolex watch so you can get mugged for it? You know, I mean, it's yet everybody wants to have a pretentious expenditure. And that helps drive demand in our modern capitalist society. My advice to the young people is don't go there. The hell with the pretentious expenditure. I don't think there's much happiness in it. But it, it does drive the civilization we actually have. Someone who has you know, been through the Great Depression, been through poverty and war times, he is actually really glad that you know our world has become so much better with technology. We are living in a much better place, but people are not really happy. We are filled with envy, we are filled with jealousy, and all these emotions actually plague our lives. We often take things for granted and we compare ourselves to our neighbors, to our friends. And you know, in Chinese, there's a saying called Yi Shan Hai Bi Yi Shan Gao, which is essentially saying that there's always going to be another mountain that is higher. And you know, the comparison trap is never ending. There's always going to be someone who is better than you, right? So we have to put an end to all this because comparison, um, upward comparison, um, can make us feel like it's motivating. But most of the time, right, we're actually, you know, forced to not do anything. We're actually trapped by our own inaction because we constantly compare ourselves to others and end up thinking that we're not good enough, we don't have enough, and we, you know, we will just won't do anything. So this is a very unhealthy way to live life. And he also mentions about um, this kind of spending, which is very pretentious, like buying a Rolex watch and you know just to get marked for it things like that so we really have to remind ourselves not to get stuck in playing the status games and getting stuck in a comparison trap and really remind ourselves that we are actually living in a world where a lot of things are great you know we have great technology that is assisting us in our daily lives and the world is actually in a much better place and lastly, what is Charlie Munger's secret to living such a happy life? I'm sure we all want to find out. So let's tune in to this clip. Charlie, an another viewer writes in Kumar. He says, you seem extremely happy and content. What's your secret to lead a happy life? Well, I always say the same thing. Realistic expectations, which is low expectations. If you if you have unreasonable demands on life, you're almost you're like a bird that's trying to destroy himself by bashing his wings on the edge of the cage, and you really can't get out of the cage. It's stupid. You want to have reasonable expectations and and take life's results, good and bad, as they happen, uh, with a certain amount of stoicism. There'll never be any shortage of good people in the world. All you got to do is sink them out and get as many of them as possible into your life. And keep the rest of the hell out. As Charlie Munger says, the secret to living a happy life is to lower your expectations and set realistic expectations. Because you know how in society now, we are actually all conditioned to get a certain job after graduation or you know, your parents telling you that you can only, um, you should only work in this kind of job because it gives you this kind of pay and you shouldn't do that. All these kind of um, expectations placed upon to us by our parents or the society or even ourselves is actually quite uh, unhealthy. And you know, there's a, there's a quote that I really like from Clayton Christensen. Think about the metric by which your life will be judged and make a resolution to live every day so that in the end, your life will be judged a success by Clayton Christensen. So if you define success in your own terms and set a yardstick to it and commit to you know, living it every day, then at the end of your life, you can say proudly that, you know, oh, I've actually achieved success in my life, regardless of what other people around you define success. So that is something that is really powerful and 
something that I always try to constantly remind myself as well. And also, I think practicing some level of stoicism and mindfulness will definitely help. And, you know, as he said, seek out good people in your life because there will never be a shortage of good people in the world and keep the rest out. So I think with that, you know, these are some of my thoughts from the AGM that Charlie Munger did. And if you've enjoyed this video and learned something new, do remember to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. So till next time, stay curious and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!